Okay, welcome everybody to today's Vaccelerate webinar. Um, it'll be the last one for this year, um, but we are very happy with the attendance of the prior webinars of this webinar. And uh, no doubt the reason is today because we have a uh, famous investigator and person, Matthias Preusser, a, a professor of internal internistic oncology and uh, at the Medical University of Vienna. And I can see from the list that, uh, from the list of participants, that we have quite some uh, hematologists, oncologists, and, uh, and certainly infectious diseases from all over Europe. So the most northern that I saw is Finland, but all the way down to the deep south. And quite in the middle is Austria and is Vienna. And uh, Matthias Preuser uh, has not only published in the field that we are very much interested in, uh, and specifically at least I am, because I'm an oncologist too, so uh, not only published in that field, but uh, as I just heard in the, um, in the few minutes that we, that we now spent before uh, the full hour at four o'clock, uh, we will even um, have the privilege that uh, Matthias will share some new data that have not been published. So just wonderful. That's what the webinar is there for. And I'd like to very briefly say that Matthias Preusser studied medicine at the medical faculty of the University of Vienna. And then after several career steps in Germany and Heidelberg and at the Memorial Stone Catering Center in New York, he finally returned to Vienna, and uh, I'm sure that Vienna is very happy, the university, to have your back. And, and there you are, an oncologist, and as said, a university professor and the head of clinical department of oncology at the medical university there. Um, so his works cover neuro-oncology, molecular therapy targets, biomarkers, immunotherapy of cancer, and very lately, as for so many of us, corona. A virus disease. With that, I hand over to Matthias Beusser. Thank you very, very much for being with us today. The floor is yours. We are very happy and thrilled to see your data and listen to your talk. Thank you very much, Oliver, for this very kind introduction. Uh, I hope uh, you can see my slides and you can hear me. Okay, Perfect. great. Um, so thanks for the invitation. Very happy to speak about this uh, topic. The topic today is the humoral immune response in hemato-oncological patients and also healthcare workers who received um, uh, coronavirus vaccinations. Here are my declarations of interest. Um, just to set the stage with, with the background, um, which uh, is um, probably very clear to many of us. Um, cancer patients are at, at, at an increased risk uh, from, uh, from the COVID uh, pandemic due to several reasons. One of them is that they, they have a relatively high mobility and mortality when they are infected by this virus. Um, but of course, there are also um, other uh, risks uh, uh, in, this, in this field. Um, so late uh, diagnosis of early cancers um, is, is a risk, of course. Um, and uh, disruptions or delays of treatments or follow-up visits are also a risk of our patients. Um, so um, it's our main task these days to try to keep up our services to our patients uh, as uh, much as possible uh, and at the same time to protect our, ourselves, our institutions and our patients uh, from, from infections. The International Oncology Societies um, um, recommend um, that uh, all patients with cancer should uh, get uh, vaccinations as a protective measure. Um, however, the data about this topic, um, namely how they respond and how safe um, um, vaccines are in cancer patients, um, have not been there during the pandemic from the beginning. Uh, in, in the first studies, only a few cancer patients um, were uh, enrolled, but now the, the knowledge and the data <clears throat> basis uh, on, 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 on cancer patients is evolving and we see more and more publications and data emerging uh, on this topic. Um, you know that cancer itself and also some cancer treatments have immunomodulatory effects. The tumors themselves um, are um, associated with uh, immunosuppression. 
both in the local human environment, but also um, on a systemic level. And there are different uh, cancer treatments which can be immunosuppressive on the one hand, for example, chemotherapies or CD20 targeting um, uh, antibodies or, or tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But there are also drugs that stimulate the immune system, for example, immune checkpoint inhibitors, which activate the immune system in a way that uh, helps the immune system to detect the cancers, uh, the cancer cells and, uh, and to attack them. The underlying question, of course, is how do these uh, immunomodulatory effects of the tumors themselves, but also of the treatments, interfere and interact with uh, cancer uh, sorry, with uh, COVID vaccines. Out of necessity, um, uh, we started uh, a research project here at uh, our department. Um, our department is a relatively large medical oncology department. We see we have about 50,000 uh, patient contacts per year um, and have a biobanking uh, program in place and collect uh, blood samples of uh, patients um, over time. We do this since about two years or so, and uh, we took advantage of this program uh, by just simply measuring uh, the antibody levels in our pa patients um, that we collected uh, in this biobanking program and expanded our biobanking program to healthcare workers because we wanted to have a control group um, of healthy uh, people to compare with uh, cancer patients. And we collaborated with another uh, uh, hospital uh, in Meran in, uh, uh, in, in Italy. And the data of these investigations uh, I would like to uh, share with you today. Some of them are published. Um, and some of them are under review at a, at a journal. I've not uh, shown them before, so I will be happy to uh, receive any comments uh, from you. Um, the first uh, publication on this topic um, appeared uh, in September, so it's um, not so long ago, but still uh, um, already the the data are um, becoming outdated, I must say, because um, in this in this first work we covered the, um, the, the, the antibody levels after the first and the second vaccination. And of course, now, nowadays, it becomes much more uh, interesting to speak about what happens after the third vaccination, after the booster vaccination. And exactly on that question, I will provide some uh, data today. So what we, did we do in this uh, first uh, work? Uh, you can see here the, the baseline characteristics of the patients that we included in this uh, study. It was a retrospective uh, study um, performed in two patient cohorts, uh, one from Vienna, as I said, you see here, we included 111 patients and, um, and 484 patients from Meran. Um, this is a, a small rural hospital, but very well organized, um, especially with the biobanking program, which is uh, extremely impressive. Um, you can see here the breakdown of the patients by, by baseline characteristics, age, uh, gender, and so on. Uh, and I want to draw your attention to, to the to diagnoses that were included. You can see um, that we, we have uh, included both patients with solid cancers, but also hematological cancers. And I think that's a value of, uh, of, of this cohort because uh, other reports in the literature usually focus on either solid cancers or uh, hematological cancers. And we were able to compare these cohorts in, in fairly large uh, groups in our study. Um, you can see that um, reflecting the diseases that are treated at, at my department, we included only um, solid cancers because we have a separate hematology department at our university, um, but the hematological cancers um, uh, came from uh, Meran. I think I see something in the chat, but um, um, I think we will discuss and take questions later. Uh, but please feel free to put questions into the chat uh, during the talk so we can go back later. Um, uh, looking into what the patients received in terms of cancer treatments, you can see also a, a wide range of therapies that were applied. Um, chemotherapies, targeted therapies, immune checkpoint inhibitors, combination therapies. Um, some patients also were uh, not under um, active uh, treatment, but in uh, in follow up uh, in, in follow up um, uh, and and and, and um, gave the blood during follow up visits. And you can see also here that a number of patients received 
B-cell targeting agents like uh, like the ones listed here, which are of course of particular uh, concern and particular interest because uh, one can assume that patients who receive B-cell targeting agents may have an impaired, uh, impaired uh, response to uh, vaccines. And that is also known from other vaccines. Um, which vaccines uh, did the patients uh, receive? Um, uh, well, first, in the, in the first two uh, rows, you can see that uh, some patients um, had verified um, uh, coronavirus infections uh, in their clinical history, and uh, some had uh, anti nuclear uh, capsid antibodies, um, uh, and thus uh, had um, biochemically, biochemically proven prior infections. Um, but these were only few patients. And the vaccines that were used were mostly um, the Pfizer uh, vaccine, while uh, other vaccines were only used in, in very few patients. So um, we didn't have statistical power to compare different vaccines in this study. Um, and there was um, so 62% uh, of the patients in Vienna and 100% of the patients in Milan had received one vaccination at that time and 40% uh, in Vienna and 25% uh, in Milan were fully vaccinated, which at that time meant two vaccine, vaccines delivered. Um, since um, these an analyses were done in two different institutions uh, in uh, real time in Milan and as a pooled analysis in Vienna, um, um, two different assays were used. So all the patients that were analyzed in uh, Vienna um, we measured the antibodies um, based on a, on a Roche uh, platform, as you can see here, while the patients that were um, uh, included in Meran uh, were measured with another assay, the Abbott assay. So these are differences in, in, the, in the methodology um, done in the, in the lab. Um, and this is important to keep in mind because for some analysis, we, 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 we couldn't pool the entire cohort and, 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 and do uh, analysis because that would have introduced a, a bias by these uh, uh, different methodologies. Looking at the results, I'm just trying to get rid of this control panel because it's kind of blocking my own view. Anyway, um, you can see in this, uh, in, in this first plot here, um, that there is, um, and this is looking at uh, the, the patients um, uh, in, uh, in Vienna, that there is a significant difference between patients who were partially vaccinated, meaning who had one uh, and, uh, and uh, two uh, vaccines. And there was also a small group of patients who had both vaccinations and had prior COVID, and these uh, had the highest antibody levels, even on a significant level. At, at that time, a third booster vaccine was not available. So we um, used this in argu argu as an argument to say probably a third vaccination uh, will be useful. Um, but uh, as I said, at that time, the booster vaccinations were not um, available. Um, looking at the Meran uh, cohort, <clears throat> we can see that um, overall, there was a significant increase of the antibody levels between the first and the second dose. Okay, this is uh, not very surprising. If we go to the panel B, we see the first uh, interesting uh, thing that looking at the tumor types, uh, we, we see that um, there is a significant difference between patients with solid tumors on the one hand and uh, hematological cancers um, who received um, B cell targeting therapies. And even if you look within the hematological cancers, you see a significant difference in antibody production between those patients who didn't receive B-cell targeting uh, uh, therapies and those who did. Um, this is true for, for uh, the situation after the first dose shown in B, but also after the second dose uh, shown uh, in C. So proving that the B-cell targeting therapies do impair the humoral immune response. Um, looking uh, in, in, uh, at, the, at the solid cancer patients uh, and, and the breakup between the different therapies, 
we see that uh, chemotherapy patients who are on active chemotherapy have significantly less uh, or uh, uh, um, lower antibody levels than patients on uh, targeted treatments um, or, or also on patients who are in follow-up um, or in also patients who re receive other treatments. Also, this is a, a small sample size, but what do we mean by other treatments? These were, for example, hormonal therapies. So overall, patients on active chemotherapy uh, had the lowest um, or had lower antibody levels than, than other cancer patients. Looking at the, um, at the difference to healthcare workers who, we, uh, who served as, uh, as, as healthy controls. Um, so also in the healthcare workers, we see um, an increase between the antibody levels after the first and the second dose. Again, not unexpected. And if we, when we compared, and this is uh, uh, the panels B and C, the antibody levels between uh, healthy persons and cancer patients we see, and this is, uh, uh, mind you, um, the, the Vienna cohort, because um, uh, these were all measured with the same assay, so we didn't, didn't pull this uh, with the Moran uh, patients, meaning that we're looking here at patients with solid cancers. And here we see that uh, patients overall have lower antibody levels than healthcare workers, both after the first and after the second dose. Um, what about the booster shot? And these are the data um, that we collected in the last uh, two weeks and have, have submitted uh, to, to, a, to a journal. It's uh, under review. It's again the same uh, setup with a cohort of patients uh, and also healthcare workers collected in Vienna and patients collected in Meran. Um, over 400 cases overall. <clears throat> again, various solid cancers and uh, various uh, hematological uh, malignancies included in this investigation. And again, a wide range of uh, ongoing treatments, chemotherapies, targeted therapies, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and so on. And again, a group of patients who received B cell targeted agents, and most of the patients um, have again received um, uh, the, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, and but uh, you see that also some uh, have received other other vaccines, but these were the min minority. Um, um, looking at the healthy controls, we see, as expected, an increase of the antibody levels after the second, from after the second dose to after the uh, from after the first dose, dose to after the second dose, and then again a significant increase after the third uh, dose, but this is already at a very high antibody level. So showing that the booster dose is uh, effective uh, in, this, in this cohort of healthy uh, people. And if we look now at the comparison to uh, cancer patients, we see that patients um, after the third dose and healthcare workers after the second dose have similar levels um, and that patients have significantly lower uh, antibody levels after the third dose. So again, what we see in, in our first investigation that cancer patients overall seem to, to, um, uh, seem to produce less antibody cells than, than uh, healthy people. Um, what about the antibody levels um, and their development over time? What we did here is um, to, to compare um, the antibody levels after the first, second, and the third dose in our patients. And you can see that over time, there's, uh, there are differences. Um, so the antibody levels um, are highest after the, the third dose. Um, Again, we see after the, the booster shot that patients with hematological malignancies on B cell targeted agents have significantly lower antibody levels, which is uh, disappointing because our hope was that the booster shot rescues uh, the B cell targeted, uh, the B cell um, um, treated, the anti B cell treated um, uh, patients, but this uh, does not seem to be the case. Again, we see um, that patients on chemotherapy um, numerically do a little bit uh, better in terms of antibody levels uh, than, than those patients with, without ongoing antineoplastic treatment. 
Uh, and if we look um, into more detail how this evolves over time, you can see on the x-axis um, that we compared the antibody levels at three months, 4.5 months, six months, and after the third dose, um, um, <clears throat> um, going away from the, from the second vaccine. So time point zero here is the second vaccine. Uh, and you can see that the antibody levels after the second vaccine um, show significant drops over time, but the third uh, booster brings up the antibody levels to, uh, to, very, to, to, to very high levels. This is true for solid cancer, cancers and hematological uh, malignancies without B-cell targeted agents. However, we don't see this effect in patients uh, receiving B-cell targeted uh, treatments. Here you see that the antibody levels are overall low at any time point, and the third uh, booster shot does not lead to a significant increase. We also compared those patients who had a prior um, COVID infection to those who didn't, uh, and uh, we didn't see here um, uh, very obvious uh, differences in both groups, the third uh, uh, shot leads to a significant increase uh, compared to, to before the third uh, vaccination. Um, I just want to highlight that, um, and this is in the context, uh, so thinking about those patients who don't get uh, protection from the, from, the, from the booster shot, so the, mainly the patients uh, with, uh, who receive B-cell targeted uh, treatments, um, it's clear that we need uh, more protective measures or additional protective measures uh, to, 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 to take care of those patients. And here, that's why I uh, projected this uh, paper we published in the, in the first uh, and second uh, wave of the pandemic, where we looked at how to protect the patients in, in the hospital setting. At this time, no uh, vaccines were yet available, and it was very much debated how much regular testing in the hospital setting uh, is useful. And what we saw here um, is that regular testing, um, and we did that at the time um, twice a week in our, in, in our patients, <clears throat> um, was very effective to, to, uh, to, to protect our patients in our institution. So the cancer cohort that you can see here were a thousand uh, patients um, who we saw at our department. The control cohort one was the was a random sample size from the population of Austria. And we showed here that in the cancer cohort, um, there, was, uh, there were not, not more uh, infections than in the general population. However, the control cohort two, and these were patients, non-cancer patients that, were, that um, came to our hospital uh, in, in areas where no regular testing uh, was foreseen, and these had, had uh, 18 times higher infection rates. So showing that regular testing uh, is very effective in the hospital setting to keep the infection numbers uh, down. And I just uh, pulled this up again because um, I feel the patients on B-cell targeted treatments are exactly those patients that can be um, hopefully protected, at least in the hospital setting, by very strict uh, uh, hygienic measures. Um, <clears throat> we also looked at the tolerability of uh, the booster shot, uh, and uh, as could be expected, we didn't see any unexpected uh, toxicities. So these are self-reported symptoms by the patients, and uh, overall, this vaccine also at the third dose is uh, well tolerated. So to summarize, cancer patients have lower antibody levels after vaccinations than uh, healthy controls. We see a significant waning of antibody levels uh, after two shots. Um, over time, uh, and we see a significant increase after the booster shot. However, patients receiving chemotherapies, and especially those receiving uh, B-cell targeting uh, treatments, have uh, lower antibody levels, uh, and the lowest uh, are uh, in, in those patients who, uh, who receive B-cell uh, depleting uh, treatments. Um, so overall, cancer patient subpopulations appear um, especially vulnerable to COVID infections, and we need additional uh, uh, protective measures or new drugs, um, but of course, new studies to get a better uh, view on these patients. And that's it from, from my summary. Um, I heard it's the last webinar before Christmas, and so this 
uh, I wish you all a Merry Christmas and uh, and a Happy New Year. And let's see how this how this evolves. But uh, I think that the data and the developments we see with the Omicron variant are very worrisome. Well, thank you very very much, Matthias. And um, I'd like to remind the uh, all the participants of today that you can either type in your questions in the um, Q and A box or in the chat. Um, either one, we will go through them. And um, if, if before I do so, or no, let's start with, there's one question we can start with. Uh, uh, it's in the chat box, Matthias. And um, uh, it's, I, I, I can read it. So um, are the antibody titers blunted at the upper level or was diluted serum tested in case titers were at the higher limit of detection. Uh, so, and the question behind the question, are there maybe some where the titers were even higher in some groups? No, I don't think so, no. So we, we, we didn't dilute the, the serums uh, in, uh, at a higher limit. So I don't think there, were, I wouldn't need to confirm with the lab, but I don't think that's the case. So I think what we're seeing here is it's not planted. And at the very high end, it might anyway not be that precise then the number uh, that, that uh, is a result from the testing. Thank you. Um, any other questions, please feel free to type in as said. Uh, while I am, th that's very interesting. Uh, I'm, I very much like this database uh, basis, uh, what you shared with us in terms of those uh, that are not so good off. So the solid tumor is okay, but what about the, um, what is your strategy in those uh, who receive uh, rituximab or any other anti-CD20 or anti-B cell um, strategy and treatment? Uh, do, do you give up on them when they don't respond after your booster shots? Or uh, so what is your, what do you practically do? Well, I still I still recommend vaccination for for all patients because we don't know what the cellular immunity looks like in these patients, um, so we cannot exclude that there's still some some protection by the vaccine. So I wouldn't interpret our data in that way that those patients shouldn't receive vaccination. All of them should be vaccinated, in my view, um, and we need to. Uh, to increase our protective measures, the ones that we know very well, like FFP2 masks and all the hygienic measures and social distancing. Um, and then there are new drugs coming up, like uh, like the, the um, like uh, the recently uh, released uh, data from of, of this uh, Pfizer pill or even antibodies um, that can be given prophylactically. But we miss, uh, at least to my knowledge. Uh, the data about uh, activity of these drugs first in this patient population but also concerning the new variants so, yes, my, yeah, so yeah. agree yes it's the the uh molnupiravir lagevrio is the one from from msd merck and then the other one i still need to get used to uh to the drug names actually uh is the paxlovid um and uh, that, that's the one from that Pfizer is, is working on. But we are, so far, we didn't see a lot of data and certainly not in these populations. I doubt that there are any studies have been executed in, the, in, in our, well, in, in one, of the, one of the core populations that we are highly interested in at Accelerate as well. Um, so how do you, um, I need to ask this. So, um, Many oncologists, many hematologists are now giving antibodies um, that would be just because that's the one available, the uh, casirivimab and imdevimab, runapreve, uh, as a pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, you, you didn't mention that, I think, uh, but is that something you, you are doing in Vienna too? Um, we, we had... We had a board meeting on this uh, for the city of Vienna uh, today and what is, where, we, where this was uh, discussed. Um, and we, it seems like um, we will do this. We're working on criteria to define patient populations um, that, 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 that are eligible because we feel we cannot offer it 
broadly to anybody, but you need to uh, define patient populations. Uh, and within this first draft of eligibility criteria, um, we defined patients uh, who had uh, who, who received B-cell uh, targeted treatments, for example. But we also want to consider the antibody levels, knowing, of course, that um, uh, that the evidence level basis is weak. But on the other hand, um, things are moving fast, so we need to uh, make pragmatic decisions. Um, but as I said, this is work in progress. But to answer your question, yes, I think we will uh, in Vienna. Um, be able to offer this uh, to patients, um, of course, not in, in a regis registered indication, so, but uh, kind of, a, of an off-label use with all the, the, the risks uh, that come with that. Um, I would be very keen on learning how you think about this. There are some oncologists uh, actually uh, on uh, participating today. So um, while we wait for, their, for them weighing in, what I can say is that we um, have relatively high numbers, so three-digit numbers of patients receiving um, the, the, that antibody combination. Um, uh, it, it is um, yes, sort of off-label, but actually, actually it's, it's, uh, it's, it's okay with our Ministry of Health to, to use it in that indication. And they actually provide it. So it's not that we could get it from the pharmacy, but it comes directly through the ministry. And that is the case all over Germany. So uh, for those hospitals who, who decided on, on, on to go down that path. Um, of course, the, uh, with the uh, Regeneron products, the problem is that uh, we hear the reports and the uh, results that in vitro, they are not active against Omicron. Um, so it is a strategy for now. It is not a strategy likely for second half of January or so. Depend, it, it might not even be a strategy today in the UK, for example. So following the uh, the um, epidemiology and following the the, the spread of uh, Omicron variant. Um, there are, oh, oh, and by the way, we do have a set of uh, criteria, exactly what you said and what you discussed today in Vienna, uh, same thing here. Uh, one of the criteria that must be the same, I guess, for you as well, is that, uh, that a um, mRNA vaccine had been given without success, I mean, without antibody measurable success. Uh, so here's one question. How often do you give the antibodies from Holger Hebert? Uh, we give it in case of an infection. Yes, that is, he, he uses the antibodies, what they were developed for, which is um, for treatment, uh, in early treatment in uh, as soon as possible after infection, these patients were diagnosed. Yes, we do the same. Do, have you used them treatment-wise, Matthias? No, no, we haven't. But I think that's an, an important question. Would you wait until, buddy is, is, uh, until somebody's infected or do you give it um, prior to infection? Yeah, that's I the two indications. That's, uh, yeah, e either can be done. Um, <clears throat> and um, so, yes, yeah, so, so for speaking for Cologne, we, we use them first in the indication that Holger Hibbert is, uh, is um, addressing, so treatment, early treatment, we see quite some successes because the B cell depleted patients might have viremia and, um, and, uh, and we can end that with, with the infusion, which certainly is, is, is a good thing to do. And, and we see better results than what we were afraid. We thought that they're all gonna die, but with the antibodies, it really is a, a good way forward, specifically since Omicron not yet arrived and hopefully soon we will have the drugs that Matthias, you mentioned. But, yeah. but has anybody, um, or does anybody use these antibodies before, um, before infection, so? Yes, we do that with our outpatients. We yeah. uh, we have a dedicated unit now uh, set up just for uh, the um, for the antibody delivery, and then they go back home. Okay. Um, we we indeed do that, and uh, for now. So there are some more uh, questions and remarks in here. Let me check. 
Uh, did uh, Matthias, did you test, uh, did your lab test neutralizing activity? No, that's a limitation of our work. We, we haven't done that yet. Yeah. And in terms of antibody titers, and that goes in the direction of what's your strategy if you're not successful um, with, um, uh, with antibody production in, in, uh, in a vaccinated um, patient. So if you, if you don't succeed and um, you say one should continue trying to vaccinate, which is, I fully uh, support that. Um, and, and Jürgen Pratt is from Graz, so I wouldn't say your neighborhood, but uh, from, from your country. <laughs> Jürgen Pratt is asking, uh, in terms of antibody titers, do you think that heterologous vaccination is what one should do in these patients? For example, vector-based first, followed by mRNA, or the other way around. I mean, you, you did a lot with vector-based in Austria, I think. Yes. So um, I cannot answer this, this question based on our data, um, because the, the subgroups were way too, too small. So this, uh, this comes down to a, to a couple of cases. So I can not even speculate. Uh, nobody knows, and <laughs> I don't want to to do guesswork. The the, the, the answer is I cannot answer it on uh, based on our data. So would you rather, in a patient, give another mRNA shot, or say let's try an AstraZeneca or J and J? Well, personally, I would switch. Um, but this is just more or less uh, gut feeling. Yeah. We will learn from Jürgen whether he whether his gut feeling is in the same direction. Uh, maybe he let, lets us know in the chat. So um, Holger Hebert again asking how often do you give the antibodies? Yeah, actually you would have to give them once a month, I guess. And um, if you would use it prophylactically or pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, that nobody knows, but that is what's currently being discussed. And that's for the regen regeneron one. So others uh, that we might see with a longer half-life um, might be uh, might be different from that. Um, yeah, that is uh, actually Olga was missing the answer. So he, uh, he, uh, the, that recent comment from from you, Olga, thanks, is at the same direction. I'd say. Um, so. Um, one more question that I would have, if I may, is wh when do you measure antibodies? You, you, you may have said that and I have missed it, but when, when do you measure after a relative to the, to the vaccine? So you, you, you give the vaccine to the patient and what's the time frame? Yeah, well, so um, we have this biobanking program, which was established uh, in, in pre-corona times. So what we do is we take the blood samples um, at, at the times of restaging, um, meaning every three months usually. Uh, and and that's, that, that's what we do. Uh, and this is a, a retrospective study. So the, the time lapse between the vaccination in the, in the individual patients to the time point when, when the, the antibody level was measured, there, there's a range in it, right? It's, it's not a prospective study where we can say we took at week eight uh, after vaccination, the antibody level. But overall, um, it's, uh, it's in the range of weeks after the, after the, um, after the, 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 the vaccination. And in, in the Meran cohort, it was, um, the, the biobanking was set up after, specifically to test the antibody levels. And there, the, the, the bloods, uh, blood, uh, uh, blood samples are taken um, at, at the weekly interval, uh, sorry, at the monthly interval after the uh, after the vaccinations. Oh, that's interesting. And uh, so, because I mean, there is no recommend. The recommendation is rather to not test, or uh, but we uh, don't want to not test. We want to rather uh, evaluate our patients and our cohorts that we have, like you do, and uh, and publish and share these data. Uh, yeah. Um, but, I must, but I must say that's an important point. I was speaking now about the research project. In the clinical routine, we don't test the antibodies. So um, I prohibited uh, my, my, 
my staff from 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 testing antibodies in the in the in the clinical setting um, because of uh, so for several reasons first of course it takes a lot of resources by with with the many patients that we're that we're seeing yeah. but at the same time there's no so far at least no clear um, um, conclusion from 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 what you measure yeah, yeah you don't want to measure and get a result back and it's a number and you don't have a reference range that is uh, will cause discussions but uh, won't be a solution I, that, that's but many patients ask for it mm -hmm. because they want to know uh, and that's why it was important um, for, also for my staff that, that they received a clear order not to do it otherwise they spent uh, you know um, too much time discussing that with the patients mm. yeah so um what, what, what I practically advise is slightly different from what, what you do and what is the, what we did until recently, and, and, and you have a perfect reasoning for exactly what you do. Um, so one, one could use the antibody response in, a, uh, in another sense, um, that is one could check antibodies to just see, I mean, it's a number, but you would just know whether qualitatively there was a reaction of the immune system and if so you might be um prone to uh yeah you might be inclined to to just give another uh another shot of the same vaccine uh, because if there is something and you might miss that if you only look after uh, a longer a longer interval that is another thought that was discussed and um, so multiple multiple ways to deal with it accelerators running the one or the other study hopefully being able to answer some of these questions but so far we did not go in the hematology oncology direction uh, we maybe we should in the meantime there's Jürgen, yes yeah. please go yeah, ahead you can put this uh, commented yes. on our discussion from before and, yeah. and he argues that he would trust on the cellular immunity and stay with an mrna uh, uh, vaccine um, yeah, but nobody knows probably what's what's the, what's the best strategy. Yeah, he says happy to see some data that proved me wrong. <laughs> <Something like this. laughs> Thank you, Jürgen. And um, so, yeah, what we can do at the moment is um, is is wear wear the masks, keep distance, etc. So, is in your hospital on on the campus? It's a large hospital, so. Is everybody wearing, or is there is there is it FFP two masks that are mandatory for for yes. for everybody, like yeah. um, healthcare workers, yeah. patients, yeah. Um, visitors? Yes, it's the FFP. occasional electrician coming in. Everybody. Everyone, everyone has to wear an FFP two mask unless you're alone in the room. Um, so uh, in all in all in all areas of the. <laughs> Of the of the hospital um, and also the the entrance uh, is is very strictly controlled now, which was very difficult to set up in a large uh, place like this with uh, thousands of people uh, going in and out every day. Um, and there are still sometimes people who somehow manage to get into the hospital without um, um, with a, even with a positive result. It happened too, um, so that's uh, that's an issue. Um, <clears throat> Otherwise, um, um, I think it's very, very important to, to, to be as strict as, as possible. And, but this is very difficult in the clinical setting, especially at an oncology clinic, because, of course, patients wants to, want to bring their relatives to very important discussions with the doctors or um, patients are, are dying and want to, and, and of course, um, relatives want to come to, to, to visit. Um, or people are have a brain tumor and are cognitively impaired or or so and need somebody to come with them mm -hmm. and this is a constant discussion which is uh, sometimes very difficult and sometimes also very difficult uh, decisions have to be made um, um, to protect other, other patients and and staff members and so on um, i don't i don't know how your experience is there but this is um, this is not easy oftentimes we now have a huge force of um, of um, well personnel with yellow jackets who are all over campus and the campus here in Cologne is I think it has more than 60 60 or 60 buildings so it's uh, 
almost impossible and it's in the middle of the city so there is not just one main entrance or something uh, so very similar to to many of the large university hospitals i guess difficult to control and the yellow jacket guys are security and they uh they they carry masks i mean they have masks with them so if they uh, find someone without then there is immediately that uh offer of a mask and uh um, so yes, but but you you find people who don't wear their masks appropriately and all these things and and even positive tests seeking help uh, on the hospital ground, which is not a good thing to do. Yeah, that's. Um, I did, don't see new questions at the moment, but that might change. While I remind you that you all can earn. EACME credit points, or actually it's one point for uh, per, per session, all the webinars that we run are accredited with uh, with the um, uh, uh, with the uh, with that system. And um, Fiona Stewart and Janina Lekla, you uh, will tell me if I miss any housekeeping uh, remarks. Um, we will, we do record the session, as you all know, and the session will then be uh, soon on our website, etc.eu. And, uh, oh, before I forget that, Matthias, your site uh, is a site, is an accelerate site, so it's a registered site through um, through Markus Zeitlinger, um, the, uh, our national coordinator for Accelerate in Austria. So you would be um, informed if we do, um, if, if we would run a study in, in that area, for example, or otherwise uh, of other studies that we would in the future run, uh, would of course let you know, and it would be great to have you on board uh, because we then need people who are interested in both areas and know that that's an issue and in oncology as well as in um, in uh, infectious diseases and, and vaccine development. Yeah, Markus, Markus has his office next door. Um, I see him uh, almost every day, either walking in or walking home. Um, and we're happy to cooperate, of course, and, and collaborate and participate in any studies. Just wonderful. And I'm sure we will have opportunities to do so. Um, there are no new um, messages in the chat. So last chance for your questions to Matthias Poiser. If that is not the case, then I'd like to announce the next webinar next year, January 19, 2022. Um, that'll be at three o'clock, so a bit earlier than today's. Uh, would love to see you there and discuss with you there. And uh, well, so long, Merry Christmas. Thank you once more, Matthias. Wonderful talk, great data. Thanks for sharing data that were not published because that is, of course, uh, always another highlight during, during the webinars. And with that, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to everybody here. Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank bye you bye. very, very much. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thanks for your help. Bye. Bye.